the United States and China are no longer on speaking terms. Having put diplomacy aside, these two great powers are engaged in diatribe accompanied by military posturing and preparations for a war in which the only certain outcome is the devastation of Taiwan. But the contest between America and China is not primarily military or ideological. It's about relative national strength and performance. China seems more focused on this reality than the United States. The Cold War is long over. America's unipolar moment has passed. And the Pax Americana, as uh, you said, one ran, is no more. With its dem demise, two changes in the American worldview have provided the geopolitical context for the descent of US-China and US-Russia relations into adversarial antagonism. The first was the assertion by Washington securocrats that the world could be understood in US foreign policy organized by reference to quote, great power rivalry, unquote. The second is the claim by think tank liberal interventionists that an attack on democracy by predatory authoritarianism has become the central dynamic of history and world affairs. The Biden administration has embraced both theses. It presents them as firm convictions, not hypotheses. Together, they've given birth to the new American objective of a 21st century, quote, rules bound order, unquote, crafted and led by the United States and its Cold War allies. This has no prospect of gaining international traction. The notion that great power rivalry is the core function or feature of international relations is best understood as a distillation of American militarism. It is a fantasy of the military industrial complex. Great power rivalry is a concept that provides a rationale for unbounded defense spending by analogizing interactions between nations to those on a battlefield. It reduces foreign policy to zero sum games between great powers while denying agency to middle ranking and smaller powers in shaping the world order or determining their own destinies. Positing great power rivalry as the central feature of world affairs is an expression of nostalgia for the global feudalism of the Cold War, when lesser nations were necessarily caught between competing overlords and forced to defer to alien agendas. Not surprisingly, this premise has not found much welcome abroad. It's also now clear that great power rivalry is not the dialectic that will cure the entropy of post Pax Americana global and regional disorder. What is emerging is a world of multidimensional interactions between countries in which almost all, all are driven more by their desire for autonomy than for alignment with the United States or its appointed great power rivals. Asked to choose a superpower or patron, middle ranking and smaller powers almost invariably hedge and persist in pursuing their own interests as they see them. Foreign policies based on wistful remembrance of past supremacy and the misperception of contemporary infirmities are bound to fail. They are hallucinations that preclude successful navigation of the world's nearly, nearly fluid geopolitics, frustrate those who adopt them and vex those to whom they are applied. They are not a basis on which to reaffirm US global leadership. As for the claim that democracy is under attack by quote, authoritarianism, unquote, this is good politics, but politically warped analysis. It appeals to Americans for many reasons. It appears to explain the deterioration of democratic norms in the United States as entirely the fault of foreigners and thereby to absolve Americans of any responsibility for the increasing decadence of their own political culture. It embodies an unstated presupposition that democracy is the default political system of humankind, absent only when denied to a people by opponents who adhere to a putative ideology of authoritarianism. But long before they were politicians prepared to risk displacement from power by other politicians with more support at the polls, there were societies led by warlords kings, dictators, and other strongmen. 
there still are. Democracy is not celebrated for the wisdom of its decision-making. It is revered as an antidote to social and political repression that when tempered by the rule of law, enables levels of individual self-governance and orderly succession processes that no other system can match. Democratic norms appear to require many generations to establish, establish themselves in human societies. The 20th and 21st centuries provide many examples of how quickly and thoroughly these norms can be discarded. <clears throat> the world's strongmen are almost all power mad narcissists who have nothing in common other than the fear of being overthrown. They're happy to receive foreign support, but seek and find no market abroad for their personality cults or their country's idiosyncratic nationalisms. Lofty talk notwithstanding, the United States has been just as willing as China, Russia, and other great powers to sell weapons and internal security equipment to authoritarian governments and has in fact outsold all others in such markets. Inventing persistent malevolence for Russia and predatory ideological aspirations for China serves US domestic political purposes. It puts otherwise confusing international politics back into this sort of Manichaean framework that animated World War II and the Cold War. Americans used to criticize China for its well-documented indifference to whether other countries were or were not democratic or devoted to the rule of law. Now we found it convenient to reverse course and to attribute to China a values-laden crusade equivalent to and opposed to our own. But there is no evidence that Xi Jinping and the 92 million Communist Party members he leads are trying to erase democracy beyond China's borders. They are on the defensive against suspected homegrown and foreign efforts to discredit them, subvert their political economic achievements, and topple them from power. The thesis that China and America are engaged in mortal contention over what political system Americans or others should live under does not survive even minimal scrutiny. Democracy may be doing itself in here and there, but there's no league of foreign autocrats or authoritarian ideology seeking to obliterate it. The operative contest between China and America is not between competing political ideals, but between the two countries' abilities to exercise wealth and power, maintain domestic tranquility, and inspire emulation by other states and peoples. It is a contest that neither side will, quote, win, unquote, flinging politically convenient but erroneously theor erroneous theories at China will not change this. Ironically, the United States has just fallen to number 25 on the Economist, Economist magazine's annual worldwide democracy index and is now categorized as a flawed and possibly failing democracy. Now, this is disheartening. It's understandable that Americans prefer blaming Russia and other foreign miscreants to examining the internal causes of our decadence. But it is ironic that the Biden administration should, should, should choose this moment to quote, stand up for democracy, unquote, and proclaim the existence of a global struggle between democracy and something called authoritarianism. Few abroad see things at all this way. The American constitution assigned authority for policymaking almost entirely to the people's representatives in Congress. But the US president and the electorate have largely given up on the legislative branch. The president increasingly rules by decree and has acquired greater power than any king to make war on other nations and slaughter presumed enemies abroad. The erosion of constitutional democracy in the United States appears to me to be the result of a tragic combination of many factors, including the outrageous finality, chicanery, and effrontery of contemporary American politics. The recent emergence of a largely hereditary American plutocracy and educated elite. The disillusionment of those farthest down with the American dream as equality of opportunity and social mobility visibly disappear 
from American society. Elite condescension and indifference to the views of the uneducated and other members of the new and old American underclasses. The rise of social and niche media oligopolies with business plans dependent upon the creation and maintenance of communities of shared preconceptions. The nurture by such media of social microcosms defined by shared delusions based on common grievance, grievances, alternative facts, the embrace of conspiracy theories and other politically relevant affinities. The organization through social media of increasingly violent protests by disgruntled white nationalists, black victims of social and police prejudice, those recently demoted from the middle class and other marginalized Americans. The exploitation of expert systems to entrench political privilege through gerrymandering and artificial intelligence and big data that manipulate the elect electorate elite insistence on pretentious standards of political correctness on issues that the more traditional and less fortunate find both intolerant and morally offensive. Reactions to political correctness and protests by those devoted to the vanishing status quo. It's quite a list of factors. A few of these clearly make the United States more vulnerable to foreign intervention in its internal affairs than before but they are, without exception, domestic, not foreign in origin. They can only be fixed by Americans. Scapegoating Russia or China won't do a thing to remedy, remedy them. The world is rightly disbelieving of the sudden American argument that the dialectic driving history is the contradiction between democracy and autocracy. Those societies proudest of their democratic traditions are notably committed to the tolerance of political diversity, both at home and abroad. None sees the overthrow of undemocratic regimes as an existential imperative or beliefs in the divine right of democracies to proclaim, impose, and enforce their preferred dispensations as a replacement for international law and consensus. To much of the world, the gathering of the G7 in Cornwall this June and its talk of the sanctity of an ill-defined, quote, rules-bound order, unquote, looked like the convening of a club of superannuated imperialists determined to regain the dominant role in rulemaking they lost along with their empires. The members of the G7 account for 11% of the world population, 30% of its GDP at purchasing power parity, and 62% of its accumulated wealth. The G7 made no case for its members' renewed stewardship of global order, but appeared to claim it as a sort of droit de seigneur. But non-Western, meaning non-Euro-Atlantic societies, constitute a very large global majority and are no longer prepared to be treated as vassals. As they rise from poverty, almost all are focused on escape from the trauma of past humiliation by Western imperialism and colonialism. Post-colonial stress disorder is today a major driver of foreign policy in every region touched by imperialism, including Eastern and Central Europe, where the humiliation was done by the Russian dominated Soviet Union. It plays an outsized role in Hindu nationalism and great Han chauvinism. Post-colonial hangover is a major explanation for phenomena like the 1979 Islamic Revolution in Iran and the Arab uprisings of 2011. European colonialism has locked Africa into a love-hate relationship with its colonizers that's now coming home to roost through illegal migration. Latin America continues to resent ongoing interventions by the so-called Colossus of the North in places like Bolivia, Cuba, and Venezuela even as many from the region look north for a better life. Southeast Asians too bear the scars of having been subjugated by European American and Japanese imperialism. Most of the world outside the United States and Europe sees the ongoing Israeli ethnic cleansing and settlement activity in Palestine as the last gasp of racist colonialism. Islamists identify the West with this and see it as justification.
for reprisal through terrorism. The operative division in global politics is manifestly not that between democracy and autocracy, but that between former colonizers and the colonized. This is joined as a driving force by the differences between those mainly Western nations who long ago became wealthy through industrialization and, and those now striving to do the same. The wealthy can protect their populations from phenomena like pandemics. The less developed and poor are left to suffer and die. The same is true of climate change. The earliest countries to industrialize were able to ignore pollution and greenhouse gas emissions. They now prefer not to allow those embarking on development to do the same. Demand from poor countries that they've compensated for two centuries of accumulated degradation of the climate by their former colonial masters fall on deaf ears. The inability of developing countries to forestall or remediate the catastrophic impact of rising temperatures and seas, flooding and drought, or famine and pestilence promises to create an unbearable future for their inhabitants. The result will be widening chaos. For all these reasons, to most of the world, the arguments that the Biden administration is now making for a reformulated, quote, rules bound order, unquote, ring hollow. It appeals to other nations for deference to great power rivalry in combat with imaginary, imaginary authoritarian predators have little appeal. To compete with China or others rise, other rising and resurgent powers in shaping the world of the future, America needs to make a case that is relevant to current realities. At present, China seems better aligned with these realities than the United States. I, this is truly unfortunate. The world has many problems that cannot be addressed without leadership by its greatest powers. And as America shirks the burdens of leadership, China remains focused on its own reconstitution, rejuvenation, techn technological advancement, and self-interested economic outreach. Beijing shows little willingness to lead other nations and has so far demonstrated no competence to do so. America doesn't want China to replace its global leadership. Neither, for the most part, does the world. Without at least some degree of accommodation and cooperation with China by the United States and between China, India, Japan, and other great powers, neither the United States nor China will be able to mount an effective response to the planet-wide challenges now facing humanity. China now seems overconfident while the United States is mired in self-doubt. If, as the book of Proverbs puts it, pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall, China looks like it's ripe for one or the other. Meanwhile, social and niche media in the United States have sliced, diced, and sorted Americans into disillusioned and mutually distrustful sub-communities that harbor incompatible visions of the American past and future and are no longer even on speaking terms with each other. Lacking unity, America seems politically splintered, scatterbrained, and unable to agree on much of anything, except that China must be opposed. Neither China nor America currently has much tolerance for ambiguity, nuance, or deviation, deviance from popular presuppositions or prejudices. Both have administrations that are obsessed with protecting leaders from criticism and that react badly to foreign censure or to homegrown unconventional ideas. Both are therefore prone to persist in error long after they should have identified and corrected it. A combination of solipsism and mutual disdain assures that Beijing and Washington no longer listen to each other. Both Chinese and American citizens now receive almost all information through digital filters in the form of media certified and targeted judgments designed to reinforce established narratives. Neither citizenry is presented with many facts to contradict such judgments. Each finds it difficult to draw its own conclusions about trends and events touching national interests. In China, the information flow is government controlled, anodyne, but upbeat about domestic matters, self-righteously nationalistic about foreign affairs, 
and calculated to unify the people politically. In America, it is corporate controlled, discordant, bigoted about both domestic and foreign affairs and tailored to facilitate the marketing of political opinions as well as goods and services. Both systems treat objectivity as quaint and potentially subversive and indulge in the propagation of claptrap. But the media verse in America has a much higher, higher percentage of stuff that experts aptly describe with the technical term weird shit. In large measure to placate nationalistic domestic audiences, both China and America appear to have decided to emulate the foreign policy of the Roman emperor Caligula. His motto was oderent dom metuant, let them hate us as long as they fear us. This was former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo's idea of, of diplomacy. It, peer, it appears to be that of today's China as well. So much for America making friends and influencing people or China presenting itself as quote, credible, lovable and respectable, unquote. China's ruling communist party seems now to imagine that the brilliance of its ideology is responsible for China's economic and technological success. But its major contributions were to set aside its ideology, open the Chinese market to competition from foreign companies and their technologies, replace central planning with market economics and industrial policies, get out of the way of entrepreneurs, localities and state-owned enterprises, curtail wasteful defense expenditures and encourage the productive reinvestment of Chinese household savings. By stepping aside from micromanagement of the economy, the party liberated it. The Chinese people then launched themselves into a level of dog eat dog economic competition not seen since 19th century America. This spurred rapid productivity growth and deflated prices while enriching the lives of ordinary Chinese and enabling them to become the producers of one third of the world's manufacturers. These were truly amazing achievements, but they were stimulated by judicious withdrawals of state control rather than assertions of it. Now the controls seem to be going back on. This raises the possibility that as has happened before in China's history, rising prosperity could fall victim to the arrogance and corruption of a domineering state bureaucracy. If this happens, who will have the courage to tell the masters of the Chinese political universe that the reimposition of the nanny state risks triggering rather than precluding, precluding Luan unrest and reversing China's economic advance by blighting the aspirations for self-fulfillment of its enormous and growing middle class. China leapt into prosperity by embracing ideologically unpalatable realities. Now many see Beijing appearing to reverse verdicts on ideological agendas previously refuted by experience. Are we back to Chong Zhe Gua Shui, politics in command? What became of Shi Shi Chiu Shi, seek truth from facts, or Yi Shi Jian Wei Zhan Li, the Wei Yi practice is the sole criterion of truth. Doesn't China need such principles along with further Gai Ge Kaifang, reform and opening to advance to the next stage of wealth and prestige? Uh, of course, uh, China now has a highly competitive, self-sustaining economy. China's development may slow, but it's most likely to continue long enough for a new generation less obsessed with the need for regimentation to rediscover the open-mindedness that catalyzed China's return to wealth and power. Sadly, whether China falters or not, the United States is presently in remarkably poor condition to compete with it. The infirmities of contemporary American democracy and its catastrophic inability to mobilize an effective response to the pandemic are telling, but the United States is now overmatched by China or about to be in just about every realm relevant to competition other than the military. And that too is increasingly uncertain. Most sectors of the Chinese economy are served by multiple competitive enterprises. Whereas in the US economy, the norm is now oligopoly, monopoly or monopsony. In China, companies still invest their profits 
in expanded industrial capacity. In the United States, where financialized shareholder capitalism now dominates, profits increasingly flow into stock buybacks, mergers, and acquisitions. China already accounts for 30% of global industrial production versus America's slightly more than 16%. China is the world's largest trading nation and the top economic partner of three fourths of the world's countries. China now vies with the United States as the largest recipient of foreign direct investment. China has about two and a half times the savings and investment capacity of the United States and its government has surplus capital to export. America has become dependent on foreign purchases of around 40% of its debt just to run existing government operations, let alone launch new programs. China is rapidly rising in the ranks of the world's innovators, while the United States, although still formidable, is slowly declining. Students in China's schools rank number one in the world in math and science, while American students rank 37th and 18th, respectively. There are now eight times as many scientists, technicians, engineers, and mathematicians in China as there are in the United States. And if nothing changes at the end of this decade, there will be 15 times as many. China has provided one third of the total global, global growth in research and development expenditures in this century versus America's one fifth. China and the US each account for about one fourth of worldwide spending on R&D, but China passed the United States in 2019 and now spends much more on basic research than the United States, where most R&D is now business funded incremental product development. In China, government spending reflects strategic calculation. In America, it reflects the vector of vested interests lobbying of Congress. Chinese um, transportation and communications infrastructure is the world's newest and most efficient. While deferred maintenance on America's roads, bridges, railroads, and air and seaports is over two and a half trillion dollars. The Congress is now crowing about having just allocated about $110 billion annually in new spending uh, over the next five years, um, new spending for infrastructure, but this is far, far short of what is required. China now allocates much less than 2% of its GDP to the military versus America's 3.4 to five and a quarter percent. If China were a NATO member, the United States would be berating it for spending much too little on defense. China can surge defense expenditures and production, whereas the United States no longer can. The greatest comparative advantage of the United States has come to be its professional and highly lethal military. This makes it politically convenient for Americans to portray the contest the United States has launched with China in military terms. China is showing that it can match and raise anything the United States does. But military posturing is an exercise in futility. Sino-American war over the much understood, misunderstood Taiwan problem, the most probable casus belli, would leave Taiwan in ruins and could leave both the United States and China, our homelands, devastated. Both would lose from any war if they did not destroy each other outright. They would be mad to go to war with each other. We must do what we can to ensure that they never do. The Sino-American contest is not about which side can outposture or outarm the other militarily. It's about the underlying sources of national strength and performance. These do not currently favor the United States. American competitiveness vis-a-vis -vis China will not be enhanced by more American military spending or the pivoting of the US armed forces to East Asia. Meeting the challenge will require a level of investment in the future of the United States that is unimaginable without an end to the American hubris, denial and complacency that have gutted fiscal responsibility, diverted wealth to the plutocracy, attracted the best and brightest to financial rather than real engineering, 
suffocated competitive markets, atrophied industry, institutionalized inefficiency and rake-offs in sectors like education and health, squeezed the middle class and decimated the capacity of the government to respond to crises. Nothing less will do. And that is why it distresses me as an American to say that while China will not gain from the Sino-American split, the United States seems very likely to lose from it. Thank you.